All right. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year's Eve. Um, let me get my phone set up here the right way. Um, hold on a second. And share. Okay. Um, now, just to get everybody up to speed, happy um, New Year's Eve. Hope everybody's going to do good things and be safe today. And special treat for you today on the Warrior Mindset and Motivation Podcast. As you guys know, I'm your host, Eric Castillo, Army veteran. Uh have veterans or civilians who impact the veteran community come on. And I was able to get in contact with this this gentleman right here. Super cool guy. Um, you guys, for those who've seen the TV show Quantico and other movies like Safe House and things like that, he's done all that stuff. He's Army veteran also, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, and he agreed to come on here and, you know, just help talk about the veteran community, help lift us up. I won't take too much of his stuff away as he introduces himself and uh, some things he's done. Uh, his name's Jake McLaughlin, or for those who don't know his name and know him as Ryan Booth on the, on Quantico, that's what you can call him if you want. So uh, I'll go ahead and let him take it away and uh, introduce himself. Go ahead, bud. Hey, Eric. Thanks for thanks for having me on, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, just Jake McLaughlin. I was a uh, um, Army Infantry saw gunner, dismount infantry saw gunner in uh, in uh, 2003. I was there for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, we, our unit was the first ones to cross the berm and push into Baghdad. So uh, I was there for that whole that whole uh, party. And uh, and yeah, I mean, it was uh, I did four years. Signed up for three, got stop lost, did four, and uh, and ended up get, getting injured. My back ended up getting injured, so I ended up getting out. But uh, I I would have probably still been doing it if I had gotten injured. So you know, right. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty awesome. Um, now I know uh, what what kind of like got you to like join the army because I know like for me personally like I I didn't really know like I did the ROTC program in high school and stuff but like that that kind of shaped it that way but it was more like you know it was schools like I wasn't really the school type college type you know I was like eh. You know, yeah, I could play sports and stuff, but like I wanted to do something bigger and more and yeah. just more challenging. When I was asked at 17 years old when I left, it was I just wanted a challenge. So like yeah. for you, what was your motivation to, to join? Well, um, honestly, the, the, the catalyst for me, because I, I was working as a security guard at Universal Studios when September 11th happened. So I was I was up there doing that and uh, it was a good job. I actually enjoyed doing it because you're out and about doing things. You're interacting with people all the time. There's also the you know, company BS that you have to deal with and all that. But, um, but September 11th happened really. And I didn't really feel like, you know, obviously it wasn't a career for me. I wasn't going to be a security guard at Universal Studios for the rest of my life. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just wasn't my, you know, my passion. I actually did want to get into acting, but then, um, and that was my way of kind of getting into this, the, the try, trying to do what the, the fabled uh, Steven Spielberg approach where he just kind of, you know, smooths his way onto the back lot you know, and, and met the right people. And, uh, and I think I, I want to say he ended up getting a trailer of some sort or an office that on the lot and kind of set up shop there. Just, you know, it was there, it was back in the day. So it was probably easy to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> but uh, I thought I wanted to be in the industry and figure out how to get or get into it. And that was the best, my best bet given that I had no proper acting training or, or knew anybody in the industry whatsoever. So uh, my best bet was to be close to it in some capacity. And so I thought figure being a security guard at Universal Studios would would uh, afford me that opportunity. But it uh, it ended up where I was mostly a security guard, but Universal Studios City Walk, where there's no filming of anything really going on other than for like yeah. a TV show, little like, you know, Jay Leno jaywalking things and stuff like that. And, uh, and uh, but if, but a, a, a lot of times I ended up getting to go down to the lower lot to be a security guard and working on like music videos. I got to do work on an Aerosmith music video, which I'm still dying to see in concert. I bought tickets three times to see Aerosmith in concert. One was with Run DMC and and Kid Rock. One was with Aerosmith and Queen, and one was with uh, Cheap Trick. And well, when I was in the military, but I got deployed every time, so now I I never got a chance to go. I got sent out to the field too. So I've never seen Aerosmith, but I got to see, I got to work on their music video. So I just thought I wanted to be around it. And like I got to be on the set of Felicity. I think it, I think it was Felicity. I used to go back there and eat their craft services and they thought I was just a security guard on set, but I, I wasn't. So basically I was stealing <laughs> food from, from uh, movie sets and uh, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, it was honest work. Uh, uh, but yeah, but then September 11th happened and that really was the catalyst. The day after September 11th, I, I shot down to the recruiting station and signed up. I think everybody felt some sort of uh, duty uh, at that time to do so. And so uh, 
there was a huge influx of people signing up for the military at the time. So I had actually got put on a delayed entry program. I didn't get to just sign up and go. I signed up, uh, went down to start my recruiting process on September 12th. And I didn't even get to go into basic training until January. I didn't get to ship out until right after Christmas. So I signed up in 2001 or, uh, yeah, in 01, but I couldn't go until January of 02. Right. And and I was in the delayed entry program also. I mean, I was still in high school, so I know how that, program works and even even i remember when that even happened i was i was actually in the field i was new to the army because i got to my unit i graduated in june of 2000 got to my first unit in december of Uh, 2000 so like i was just still fresh to the army and we were just in we had just started a two-week exercise uh it's called a battalion ftx you know that Uh, (laughs) so we had just started and our platoon sergeant walks up our smoke because i'm artillery and he's like, hey, guys, we have to march order. Um, the Twin Towers have been hit, and they're pulling everyone out the field. Well, we thought it was a training scenario. We're like, oh, okay, so where are we going? What what position are we going to next? You know, yeah. okay, we're starting this training early. That's pretty serious, you know? Like, usually it's some sort of made-up thing or whatever. And uh, he's like, no, we're serious. We're The Twin Towers were hit, and we're pull- they're pulling everyone out the field. And we were just like, are you serious? Like, we wow. like you. You could feel like just the confusion within my 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 section of, of my artillery section, and then it's just like it took us three hours to get out of the the, the training area because yep. they pulled everyone out the field, and then we went. We then we they gave us the the, the tap on the shoulder to go in two thousand three down to Afghanistan. So oh. while you were while you were an Iraq surgeon, I was in Afghanistan with the SF guys doing that stuff over there. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly yeah, that's exactly how it worked out. It was it was. Uh... It was funny that like for me, because I was a security guard at the time on that day, I got called into work right away. Like I, wa- I watched, I was, I said in another podcast, I watched the second plane hit on the news. I was watching the TV because when I, my cousin woke me up and said a plane crashed in the world trade center. And honestly, I had no idea what the world trade center was at the time. Didn't even know me what either. It was. And, uh, and then I knew what the twin towers were, but I didn't know that it was called the world trade center, but they, um, mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh, I was sleeping because it was, you know, it was pretty early, and I was trying to. I worked like you know, a sixteen-hour shift the night before, and I and so I'm like, oh, whatever, I don't give a shit. You know, that's what that was my first response when he woke me up because I just thought like, I thought, oh, a Cessna might have, you know, crashed into the thing or something. I wasn't expecting right. it to be a freaking, you know, seven thirty-seven or seven forty-seven. I wasn't expecting it to be a, a, a commercial airliner, and so I could see, I could hear kind of some whispering going on in the living room, and I go out there and I and I. I woke up and I'm like, wait, this sounds a little more serious than what I was doing. Plus, I was tired and all cranky. And I got up and I'm watching the news. And I'm going, oh, shit. And then while I'm right, like almost right when I get out there, I'm watching, they're reporting on it. And then all of a sudden, boom, the other plane hit the second tower. And I was like, oh, crap. This isn't okay. This is – and you got that feeling in your stomach. And they called yeah. me away. And, I mean, I worked till probably – I got called in probably – I don't even know what time it was, but I worked till. I don't even know four o'clock the next that that morning that next morning and then I but there were people still showing up at Universal City Walk and Studios to go to the theme park and go to the go to City Walk at like 10, 11 o'clock at night and still had no clue of what was going on. That was the thing that surprised me. I'm like, dude, have you, have you like they like <laughs> you know any TV, anything electronic, or just talking to anybody? There was no nothing else was being talked about or set or spoken of at all that whole every conversation that day was completely monopolized uh by the events that occurred and and so for people to that many people to show up clueless to what was going on that late in, in the evening was just kind of a kind of yeah a sh- yeah that was a shock it was yeah pretty- they threw us right into training like it was train train certify as a section platoon battery uh battalion brigade like it was like a whole year and then it was like okay go and yep. then from right after Afghanistan, we went to Iraq. There was no break. It was like Afghanistan, Hungary, Iraq. And it was like, geez, like, my goodness. <laughs> oh, it's and the, and, the, and the whole, like, the whole mood change changed, too. Like, when I went into basic training, the drill sergeants that were there, because uh, we ended up having two hell weeks, two zero weeks in basic, because they started <laughs> a week early because they wanted to get as many people through as they could. So the drill sergeants did it, but we just ended up having to do two hell weeks. So they – uh the drill sergeants at the time was a little different training people. Now the drill sergeants when I was in, were taking it, not that they didn't take it seriously before, but there was definitely a, a, a dial turn up to, to max to make sure that everybody that was coming through and training to be an infantryman was, was 
trained as as best as they could possibly be trained by the drill sergeants because they those drill sergeants knew that the the vast majority of the people that were coming through when we, when I was going through were going to go to combat. That was there was no doubt about it. So they they felt a an obligation on themselves to do the best job that they could to train us. And they were they're great guys. They're hard asses. They were great guys. A lot different than what it was going from what I heard from people that were going through basic training. You know, years later with like stress cards and all that crap. It wasn't like yeah, they 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 could they were still putting their hands on you back when I <laughs> when I went through. It wasn't oh yeah. You know, that now so it was uh but it was it was it was good it was a, it was a good thing to have because uh we really i really felt like when we graduated basic we were we were very well trained up but then when i went to kuwait before iraq all we did was train we trained with the sf guys we did that we ran missions with them in iraq but i mean day in and day out in kuwait it was just train 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 all day every day so by the time we went over and crossed the berm we were we were we were, we were we were pretty elite force at that point. It was pretty cool. That's what, that's what I always say too, especially when that happened. That's when I, I learned that like, I learned how to be a soldier because of that seventh group special forces when they trained us before they split us up and sent us into those PRTs in Kandahar and Kalat. Like yeah. I learned how to be a soldier there. They, they trained us so well because we didn't know what was going to happen. Our mission changed right when we got to Kandahar before it was this big old boardwalk and everything they got now. It was nothing there. Yeah, like run across the flight line to get into the airport. So like it was all small. So like is the emotions that come along with that. Like, you you know, you think like combat patches at that time weren't a big thing, you know, like yeah. it was, you see one like my 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 chief, my squad leader, he had one. And I was like, dang, I want one of those. Like, you know, like you, you see, yeah. like I want I want to do my part. Now I'm authorized to wear like seven of them. And I'm like, take them shits back. I don't want them like, you know, like. <laughs> They came out with the uh, combat action badge and all that other stuff later. And, uh, mm-hmm. But like, when, yeah, like the, anybody that had a, a, a combat infantry badge, like going through basic, we had a couple of drill sergeants that had combat infantry badges from the first Gulf War and yeah. you know, or Panama, Granada, whatever, whatever conflict they were a part of. But it was just like, oh, dude, he's got a, he's got a CIB. He's got a CIB. That, that was cool to have. And then going to war and coming back and then you've earned your CIB, you know, many times over and you come back and then, a lot of the guys that were in there got stop loss for getting out. You're getting a lot, a lot of new leadership coming in, a lot of new players. In fact, we got a guy that was my squad leader from. Uh, he was he came from Schofield Barracks, but you know all he had was his EIB, which is not easy to get either. You know no. those those are tough to get, and um, and uh, so you know that's cool to have, but but I think he felt a little bit uh, overshadowed by like all these you know specialists and PFCs and. You know, he ones the stuff coming back with combat badges, and he hadn't been to combat. And here we are coming back in, and here's a guy going, "You're going to be ten minutes early to be in ten minutes early to formation. Your boots better be shining, this and that." And all of us were just like coming back and we we're like, "Yeah, uh, that ain't fucking happening because it ain't fucking happening." And right. so it was just ended up being like a, I don't know. I, I think it was just trying to overcompensate, and that just didn't fly well with a lot of us. Just kind of deal. So you have to, you have that whole element too, with you know an, an NCO that had something to prove, and it's like don't use, right. me to, you know, to, right. And those are those are the ones you listen to, like because there wasn't too many. So like when they spoke, you listen. You know, like you're like, oh, okay, he's gonna teach us. Yeah, I'm about to learn something today. You yeah. know, because they they had that experience, and it was it was great to 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 indulge in all that. Now, for you, like, what was your first, like, feelings and emotions when they said, hey, uh, McLaughlin, you're go- we're going to Iraq. Like, what was your thoughts? Like, what was going on with you when you heard that? Because I know mine, I was like, oh, shit, here we go. Like, that was mine. So, yeah, I mean, it was – we were already in Kuwait when – so when we'd go to the chow hall in Kuwait, it was at Camp New York. We'd go in and go to the chow hall, and, and they'd have uh, news on. They'd have a TV – they had a TV in there, and we could watch the news just when we were eating. And uh, we were kind of slowly, day by day, kind of watching the buildup of the of the inspections. The uh, the uh, what are we called? The uh, not EU. The the what are the the which the, one? The ones that go in and inspect the not the not the oh my god like the, the customs guys? No, the guys that were going in to look for the what the weapons of mass destruction. The uh, kick, kick he kicked all the uh, the inspectors out. Whatever the, I can't remember the name of them now. Oh, I can't remember either. I can't remember. But anyway, we were watching the whole thing unfold uh, to to in Iraq, and so we were just kind of knowing in the back of our minds that 
there's a great potential of us to be going to Iraq to go to war, which is just, you know, right across the berm from where we were. Mm-hmm. So it just so it kind of was a slow build. And then when the fi- when then they threw us out in the desert for a month on the berm to train and not shower, you know, for a month, just do not just, just train really. And we, that's where we did a lot of the stuff with the SF guys. And so, I don't know, it was just kind of one of my, in my mind, I was just thinking, you know, it's, you know, it's scary. It is scary. You're, you're, a little, you're, you're, it's, it's scary because you there's the always the what ifs in your head you're always thinking like what if like what how's this going to play out is it going to be like the movies is it going to be like the training mm-hmm. going to be like this is it gonna, can i rely on all this stuff do i is there something that i can do personally that's different that might save my life you know like you think about these things not in depth but just kind of like they just kind of flash through your head and you don't really talk too much about it you don't really you don't talk about it really with anyone else everyone just kind of knows okay we're going to war we're not going to uh, so you just kind of mentally have to prepare that, prepare yourself for that on your own, you know, getting in that mindset. And some people handled it great and some people didn't handle it well at all. Uh, for, you know, it's, st- it's stressful. It was very stressful. And some of that we had, we had some, some, uh, some people that were just extremely stressed out about it. And all you got to do is just kind of stay away from them because you don't want to, you don't want to even, you don't want that to rub. It's contagious. You don't want that to rub off on you and, and affect you. So you just kind of get your head right and make your, make your number one, goal getting home in one piece and getting the guy next to you home in one piece because i'm better them than me you know that's the way that's the way you have to look that's the way you got to look at it is I'm, I'm going home and if it mean if one of us are going home it's going to be me you know over the over yeah. the week. so that was that was just it and then it just you know we pushed up and gotten firefights on the way up there had engagements on the way up and then we got into baghdad and that's when it really hit the fan and and uh and then we went over to fallujah after that and we were in firefights every night in Fallujah and you know but we were really good we ended, we ended up building like a you know quickly building a lot of confidence in our abilities as a unit to uh to really just be able to do to get anything that needed to get done done and we did and we did it with minimal uh minimal casualties on our on our side but you know minimal casualties is always a as a tough thing to say because any casualties are um you know not good right and, and and I know when when through those trying times that you've had your share and I've had mine and but you when it comes to like self reflection you I feel like you learn a lot about who you are like you you learn about what you can endure what you can handle and things that you didn't even think you were possible of of even attempting or handling and even doing and the adversity that you go through during those times and I think that what happens is when uh we get out of the military, depending on how you get out, you forget about that stuff. You forget about all those hurdles you went through and all those walls you knocked down because it's a whole different, it's like going into a war zone and you don't even know where you're at, what you're doing, who's the enemy, who's not. I mean, that's how it felt for me. I I felt like it was just a complete strip of identity, you know, and I was, I felt lost. I didn't know who to trust. I felt like I was by myself, you know, it was, finishing up a toxic relationship at that too. So it was like, I felt really alone at that time. Yeah. And I was, and that's not a good place to be in. No, it's not. And, and and I think that everybody has it that comes back from combat, you know, that has, that goes through some, some, what it would, to what degree you go through it. It's, it's all individual at all. It all, it all, you know, depends on you and, and how you look at things or how you view it. And there, I mean, I had some really hard times, you know, especially like not long after coming back. And then I started having to kind of, um, you know, I went and sought help from 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 uh, psychiatrists and things like that, just to just to have somebody to talk to, to kind of try to place what it was that was going on with me, with my feelings, and with like just how I felt about things. Because like, you come back from Iraq and coming back from war, and you're kind of you feel you feel completely displaced, just based on the fact that you just left an extremely stressful. <laughs> long, long, you know, a year, a year of being in combat. It's a long time to be in combat. And you're just, it changes you as a person when you come back. So you do feel displaced when you come back, you do have a fear of going back just based on the fact that like, wow, uh, how do I act? Do I, am I different? Do I, am I different? Like all the things that we just did, people here have no idea of what we just went through and what we did and what we're capable of doing. But then there's also the element of coming back in the civilian world and just watching how civilians do things and it just frustrates the living shit out of you because you know like you're waiting in line with 20 people on it and there's somebody waiting to buy a snickers bar with their fucking credit card and not like a not a not just giving them a dollar to get you know to get just get through the line you want things done efficiently fast quick getting off of an airplane things like that 
anxiety levels, your your fight or flight response is turned all the way to the fucking max. And most of us in combat don't have a flight response. There's yeah. more, we, most soldiers don't have that run away. We don't. We, we just don't have it. So any little thing that happens, you know, being having been in that that level of of conflict, and that level of uh, of just I don't even know how to describe it. That level of dehumanization, I guess, in certain certain aspects, uh, to have that and come back, and then your your patience levels are very thin with things that are done stupidly, and that and that became a problem. And like your sense of humor changes when you join the military. You have a much sicker like sense of humor. <laughs> you change, like you say things to your best friends and stuff about their family members, their wives, their moms, anything, and it's. Just, <laughs> It's all in good. T- it's all in good taste. You're all just ripping, e- just ripping each other's assholes, and and just having fun doing it. But then you have to be able to dish it out as much as you can. But you have to be able to take it as well. And like your sense of humor changes, and you come back to the civilians, you make a joke, and people are like, dude, that's you're fucking sick. That's that's fucking weird, dude. <laughs> I, I, you're like, well, I, to me, it's really funny, but uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that, it's just weird, weird things like that 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 uh, that change. And yeah, and you're you're 100 right. Like what you are capable of doing. Uh, what you, you, you surprise yourself, you're constantly surprising yourself with what you're able to do and what your what you, what your body can go through and put yourself through and, and, and just, and just accomplish. And, uh, it's in that regard, it's extremely, it's, it's a, it's a really good thing because most people will never experience that. Most people will never experience them being pushed to the absolute limits of, you know, human endurance and human ability and, and things like that. It's just, it, it really was, you know, that, that was the case for us, you know, it was just, it was just, you know, and then just to get home, like I remember coming back and I was walking home from uh, there was a Burger King right across from the barracks. And I was with my buddy Camacho and we we're walking back across the street. And I remember just my heart sinking into my stomach because I thought that I left my saw, my machine gun in Burger King. I was like, <laughs> and, like and, I, and I actually had like an anxiety, like a hardcore anxiety attack, like real, really briefly there for that where i was just like oh shit I, and i started to walk back to talk about all my buddies like what are you doing I'm like i gotta get my fucking saw and he's like no dude what like he thought <laughs> i was like oh shit because you're so used to carrying you know you have a yeah. pound weapon on you all the time when you sleep you sleep with it strapped to your leg and around you like a baby so you know nobody can take it and you know it's, it's no, I, yeah. I even had a squad where my uh my bc uh took I was down shaving right underneath on his, I leaned my saw up when we were in Baghdad, I leaned my saw up against the Bradley and I sat sitting there shaving because they made a dry shave, you know, so I'm just sitting there Ugh. shaving the thing and whatever. But they, but then I turned around and my saw's not there because he came down and took it and put it in the, in the Bradley. He snuck down from the top and grabbed it. And, took <laughs> it and, and then I got in trouble for it. I'm like, motherfucker, you came down and like, <laughs> You came out and took it from me back. <laughs> and I got and then I got yelled at for it. I was like, fuck this. You know, but whatever. That's just that's just it was it was it was in hindsight, it's funny. <laughs> I mean, and it's 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 interesting too, like, you know, when you talk to a, it's like even even though like when you talk to a veteran, another one, and you don't know them, like I don't know you, but no. when we share stories, it's like we've known each other for years because I can empathize, you can empathize, and then like like you feel like all this, you know, you, 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 it's that chemistry is there. And I think when, when, I, when I try to, when I try, at least I hope it does with this podcast, I try just to get the veterans who are kind of just sitting there, not really doing much like, you know, Hey, look, all you gotta do is talk to someone. Cause it's like, it's all on who, you know, to make things happen. Like one of my friends asked me, um, he's like, how do you do it? And I was like, do what? Like when I was talking with you, I was like, you know what? I was like, I kind of just put out there in the universe what I want. And my fiance showed me that and my friend and my coworker Aaron cho- showed me that too. Like, Hey, sometimes you just have to put it out there on what you want and just yeah. send the message. Send, Cause you never know, you know, you never know who's going to respond or like who, you know, can put you into contact with someone with someone like how we were just talking earlier on how uh, you're half native and things like that. I didn't know that. I mean, now, yeah. but see now you put my fiance in contact with someone because you know, someone, that she can talk to. So it's like, it's that networking. And I think when we get out the military, I think we, we kind of forget that, you know, and it's because it's a different bond that's formed when you deploy with someone and you like, when you literally almost die, 
it's, it's like a special bond that's formed with the, those that select group of people that is like un, un, unmatched. Like you can't compare it to anything because you, now you share a special bond with those people to yeah. where it's like literally even now, like now for me, if 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 our life here were to turn completely upside down, I know that I have a, probably only people on one hand because I don't have a lot of friends. I have a lot of acquaintances. I just friends are someone who will drop anything. I know that I have a few friends right now that would take me and my fiance and, and even my kids if I had to, if life completely flipped upside down without yeah. questions. And those were guys I deployed with, yeah. you know? Oh, we'll, help if, you, we'll help you hide a body, bro. We don't, we're, we'll help you get rid of a body if you need it. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No questions. <laughs> those, those are the kind of friends that you have there with your military. Right? And you, and like you keep in touch with those guys. Like we get together, my, my at minimum of once a year, we get together and have a reunion every single year for 4th of July. and and. I mean, this last year was a lot less people, but I mean, we've had it where there's 60, 70 people from our unit that showed up to have our reunion that we have. And we get, you know, we just, you know, spend the money to get all the beer, all the food, everything that we need. So that everyone can just relax and have a great time and just chill and share stories and just regale and remind each other of what we did. Like people remember things that you don't remember and vice versa. And it's just it's a it's a it's a really fun time. It's a really emotional time, no matter what. It's always emotional when you get together with your with your army buddies because you miss you love them. You like you don't realize that you don't realize it when you're in. You don't realize how because you're with them every day. So you just think, okay, it's gonna go forever. When you're young, you think everything just lasts forever and it doesn't. But uh, it uh, you don't realize it until it's gone. Like when I remember when I got out of the military, I remember going. God, I was waiting, waiting for a while to get to, you know, for this to, to happen. But now that I'm out, I'm kind of like, I, I even feel a little lost just when I got out of the military. Like I didn't know, I didn't know what I was going to do or what to do because I didn't, you know, my only skill job skills were construction and telemarketing and things like that. You know, little, little jobs that you had when, you know, in high school and, and things like that. But uh, you're really your only skill set and infantry doesn't really translate great into the civilian world, just unless you're going to be like a police officer or law enforcement of some sort. But even then that's, it's still a lot different than being an infantryman. There's not a lot of, you know, hired assassin work, I guess is probably the, <laughs> the only you gotta find those on Craigslist. Yeah, those are crazy. <laughs> yeah, the black web on the dark web. <laughs> uh, yeah. But it, it really is. I, 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 we, I love those guys to death. My, we, I mean, my platoon sergeant, he lives in Florida too. He was, we, we all keep in touch. All, yeah. All they, the, that's why like, and it's, it's, it's like a bittersweet because I, I freaking hate the Facebook, but I love it because I can keep in contact with my buddies. Like I have like my, my friends list is literally like half people before army, which is like high school buddies, which I kind of keep in contact with more acquaintances. And then the other half is like all the army guys and girls yeah. that I have on there, you know, my buddies, like, and it's just, they see the stuff. And like, I know one, one of the guys I always argue with, his name's Evan. We, th the way we greet each other is like no other. He's like, Hey, what's up, bitch? I'm like, Oh, fuck you, asshole. You know, yeah. and, and yeah. <laughs> that, that's our hello. You know, yeah. like, yep. he, he's like, you're still ugly. And I was like, well, you're still a turd, you know, like, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> yep. but it's, it's all in good love, you know, like, and that's, that's like, a, that's like that different sense of humor. Like, are you saying that what we have? And it's like, you can only do that with them because if I were to tell that to some of my civilian friends, yeah, they would laugh, but they wouldn't get it. They'd be like, why are you calling me that? I didn't do anything to you. You know, like, <laughs> oh, what you did. we had this guy in basic. I just had this in another podcast. I felt bad too, but we, his nickname was poop dick. We gave him the nickname. <laughs> That's what we called him. It was just, and he, and it got to the point where it was just like, you know, mine's Mac nuts. Everyone calls me Mac nuts, but like <laughs> the, 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 you know, it, you own it. you like, you, if you if you act if it bothers you then you're just gonna get it even worse. But if you exactly. just oh, yeah yeah Mac nuts or I, I, I love it and he owned poop. Dick. So we just called him that as what we called him. But then we just kind of lost sight of the fact that that was what we called him. You know that was that was his name. And so when the families come out for graduation at basic training, his mom and dad are out there and everyone's walking by. Hey hey good luck poop dick. You be good man. You know you be good. Ah oh, you too. And they're like, I'm looking. I'm like poop. What what you? <laughs> Well, rough showers, huh? Rough, rough. <laughs> oh, it was great. And like we get, like I remember, there was these guys like in uh, in uh, when we were at NTC, which NTC fucking sucks, you know. We were out of, oh. out of so it was just like, especially after coming back from war in, in the desert, and then you're going to train how you would yeah. fight. 
court. It's like, oh, get the fuck out of here with this. Yeah, it's like I already did that. Why I got to do it again? Like, <laughs> but you got to train up the new guys. But half the stuff they were teaching, you just, you know, they're telling you, oh, you wouldn't do this. And oh, I did do that in combat. <laughs> so don't tell me what I would. But anyway, that's beside the point. We there's guys that were like that would be afraid to shower in front of other dudes. You know, that would just so you. You'd see them at like one o'clock in the morning, like scurrying around, like you know Templeton the Rat and Charlotte's Web at the at the at the carnival, you know, like just stirring about. So we would just go in there to fuck with them. We would just there'd be a hundred shower heads in there, and there'd be one guy in there and my buddy, a couple of buddies. We'd all just go in there and just take the showers right next to those guys, <laughs> you know, just just to fuck with them, you know, like because they were so. Really, there's fucking 100 showers here. Like, oh, dude, no, it's, it's it's cool, man. Hey, hey, and they're just just fucking with each other. You know, like the guy next to you. Hey, dude, you look really good naked, by the way. I just wanted to tell you that I'm not gay or nothing. Just, just you know, and they just just to make it extremely uncomfortable to fuck with. You know, people you don't even know. It's just it's a stupid oh, shit. Yeah. Yourself. You get so secure with your with your with yourself and your sexuality, like having to poop next to someone, and there's no wall there, and you're just like, stop, and it's like, oh, you know, just. Taking, taking a crap, you know, like showering next to someone, you know, like, and it's like, I I, I told my fiance a story too, like when, when I was in Afghanistan in 2011, we had a fire mission come down and we had one female, she was like our sister, and we were in, uh, both in PT uniform, we had to change, um, both of our son was right there and we both like just changed, like she had hers, um, like a sports bra and underwear and I was in the box, but we were changing and it was funny because we both stopped for a second when we got, we were like, Probably like a foot away from each other, and we were changing. We looked at each other up and down, and we were like, hmm, "Not bad." And she's like, "You too." I was like, "All right, let's go." And we kept changing, you know. And then <laughs> and I never we went out, and that was it. Like it was, it was no like weirdness. It's just because she was one of us, you know. And that's just you, you. I don't even think you can do that out here with someone getting offended nowadays, you know. You can't not at all. Well, we didn't have that problem when I was in, just because of the fact that there weren't any any females in the infantry. Uh, when I was in, and they like the only female I remember seeing, uh, what was Jessica Lynch, the the remember her, yeah, uh, abducted on the way up there. I remember seeing her at the Chow Hall a few times, and and on, honestly, the uh, the uh, military uniforms aren't flattering on the women, especially they're just the worst worst outfits for women to wear. That you know, in, in BC BDUs or DCUs, yeah, zero that. justice. But you'd see girls that you'd see around on posts that were in the military. Uh, <laughs> Out, out and about when you go to like you know off post to go out to the bar or whatever you see mm -hmm. like, oh wow you're I didn't, wow you that, I didn't didn't see that at all because you're I'm so used to seeing people in DCUs and BDUs like oh you're, you're okay well all right never mind I'm carry on yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly that's why when I had saw her change I was like damn I was like you look good you know like it was a compliment I was like because the uniform does zero justice so oh, I was like us, wow for us. <laughs> So any every everybody looks good at, at, at a, after a certain point. Like when we came back, I remember when we came back and we stopped in New York and they let us out in out in uh, JFK Airport. We couldn't go past the pillars at the terminal, but they let us out to go smoke in the airport that you weren't even allowed to smoke in. So we got to go out and smoke cigarettes. People that didn't even smoke were getting off just to pretend like they were smoking, just so they could see civilian people and world walking by and stuff. And here we are. They said to put on your best DCUs. Here we are with like. You know, blood stains on our collar. Our our LB just completely shredded and ripped, and all everything we had was just completely covered in old blood or or dirt or dirt sand, ripped, yeah, just whatever it was. And we're just over there going, you know, looking like a bunch of idiots, you know, at the same <laughs> checking out every girl that walked up, a bunch of like caged lions trying to, you know, <laughs> don't don't feed the type <laughs> thing. Oh, it was good. Right, so now, like. We're gonna we'll, we'll we'll wrap up this section and then go into like the transition. So like, how was it for you transitioning out? Like, I know we touched on it a little bit. So like, was there any like specific like um, feelings or emotions or thoughts? Like for me, like transitioning out was hard for me. My unit wasn't exactly the best. And yes, it was these people right here on my freaking chest. This, I only wear the shirt because it's comfortable. But yeah, they didn't make it easy for me. Uh, they made it very hard. And uh, I know some other units do great. And for you, how was it for you, like, getting out? Well, I mean, it was tough. It was tough. And it was tough in the sense also that there were things that I wanted to accomplish when I was in the military that I never got around to doing because I was deployed, you know. So you don't get to go do – I would. I didn't want to do – I didn't want to be in Ranger Battalion. I wanted to do Ranger School, though. 
I wanted to, I wanted to get ranger school under my belt and I wanted to get uh, sniper school under my belt. And right before I was getting out, I got offered sniper school, uh, which would have been cool because I would have been in a sniper platoon that only answered to the Sergeant major, which would have been a great, great gig. Um, but I, my back was messed up and I was getting out, but then the reason, the only way they were going to offer me the sniper school is if I stayed at Fort Stewart, which wasn't fucking happening. Cause as much, <laughs> as, I, as much as I love my buddies, as much as I love my unit and you know, everybody that I was in with, even the shit bags, I love them to death. Even those guys, uh, I hated Fort Stewart, fucking hated it. I would not, there's no way in hell I was going to re up for Fort Stewart and not in a thousand, thousand years. You couldn't pay me enough money. So, uh, but that was the stipulation was I could do it, but I'd have to stay on Stewart. But the, the heart, the thing I remember, I came back and went on leave for the first leave that we had. It was in December, right before Christmas. And I was, I was uh, at my aunt and uncle's house in North Hollywood, sleeping on the couch in the living room. Cause I, I couldn't sleep even, even to this day, I still have a hard time sleeping in beds, like on a, on a normal bed. I, I slept on the floor for years after I came back from Iraq. I just couldn't get, I couldn't get comfortable in a, in a bed for some reason. And so I remember laying on the couch and everything just kind of went black in my, in my mind. I was laying there, it was completely black in the living room and everything and everyone had gone to bed. It was dead quiet. That, that was the thing that got me the most was how dead quiet everything was. And there was nothing like normally there in North Hollywood when I was living there, there was a, at least one helicopter a night that would fly over the, over the, the house looking for somebody that was, you know, on the run or some criminal that was doing something almost, almost every night. And this was a night that didn't have them, but kind of like hoping that there was a helicopter, you know, flying up <laughs> a little bit more at ease because it would feel a little bit more comfortable to me to be in some sort of high stress situation. But now I'm here in this completely safe environment where I can walk down to the gas station if I wanted to at that moment and go get an ice cold Gatorade or, or a beer or whatever I wanted to get. I could just go get it, which is a weird feeling. I could go sit on a porcelain toilet and, you know, and that was a weird feeling. I could, I could yeah. like, clothes that were comfortable and like that all of this stuff was just so foreign to me and i don't know and i think that was an, uh, like an accumulation of all of those things together in that moment they just made everything just kind of go black and i started to have this really bad anxiety attack like and i didn't know what that was at the time i didn't know what an anxiety attack was i didn't know what a panic attack i knew what they were but i didn't know what they felt like like i couldn't i couldn't breathe my chest felt heavy i, I couldn't i couldn't catch my breath my, my my i felt like i was hyperventilating and i was just going to pass out and I went in and I was like, who can I, I need to talk to somebody because I'm freaking, I'm freaking out right now. And, uh, and I went in and I was talking to my grandma and at one point I was, I was, I was crying because I was just like, felt, I don't know. I felt guilty. I, I don't know. I felt a lot of different, I felt a lot of different emotions. I don't know what all of them were, but they were, it was probably all of them <laughs> and all at once. You know, it was all of those things. It was happiness. It was everything, but it was just a very, very visceral, uh, moment and it, and and then at the end of the conversation i was telling my grandma because I'd, I'd never in my life ever cried in front of anyone in my family you know emotionally i mean obviously when i was a kid and get, get my ass back or something but not <laughs> other than that but they uh but I, and i apologized to my grandma uh for crying because I, I felt like it was just not an okay thing to do you know like i was i'm sorry for crying in front of you and it was and i was talking to her while my grandpa was asleep in bed next to her and she's sitting sitting up in her bed and it's pretty much all, all completely dark in there. And she tells me, she told me a piece of, she gave me a piece of advice that was pretty, that gave me, oddly enough, it gave, it was the perfect thing to say to me. Um, and I didn't, uh, and it just, I don't know. It wasn't much, but it just, she told me, she said, she, I said, I'm sorry for crying. She says, well, it, you know, they say the eyes are the windows to the soul. I guess they need a washing every once in a while too. And it oh, made, wow, I like that. made me feel a lot better. And I, for some reason, it was just like that weird little, you know, nugget from grandma that, uh, that made me feel a lot better. It was a really neat thing to say and a really neat way of looking at things just in a simple way, in a very simple way. And, uh, and it made me feel better. I mean, I had anxiety and panic attacks after that, you know, when I was just, the weird thing about them is that they'd come on randomly. There was no certain situation. Like it, you wouldn't get in a panic attack if you're in a gunfight at a, in a parking lot somewhere. There would be no mm -hmm. panic attack at all. You'd probably be quite the contrary. You'd probably be, I'd be more calm, cool, and collected then than if I'm just sitting down watching an episode of I don't know Friends. Like that's when a panic attack can come on. <laughs> You'll be sitting yeah. there, you're just like you know, holy shit! And then you go down to the VA hospital, at least in LA, and they're frisking you before you can even go in and get. It's <laughs> like that's making it worse. And you're just like, what the? Oh, fuck this place, you know. <laughs> So yeah, it was just, it was, it was, it was, the transition was, was, was a little tough. You felt just displaced was probably the, one of the biggest uh, 
feelings that, that I had. And like I tell people all the time, the most accurate thing that I ever, that it, uh, probably the only accurate thing in that movie, The Hurt Locker that I saw was when he came back and he's in the grocery store and he's looking down the cereal aisle and he's just kind of like, what the fuck is this? You know, like I need to go back. And that's the feeling that I think every single person when they come back has like, this isn't, this isn't me. I'm, I, you, cause you, cause you have more, you have a purpose, you know, you have a, you have a very, a, a, you have a meaning when you're, when you're in the military, you have a purpose that, that you feel proud of and that you feel strongly about. And, uh, and then when you get out, it just kind of feels, Oh yeah, this is just, this isn't as, I don't know, anything It's exciting. It's not as fun. It doesn't have much meaning behind it. And so when you get out, you have this, this thing that you did here, or going to combat and fighting for your country and serving your country and doing these things. You have this level of pride and this level of, of just uh, accomplishment that's up here and this, and all the emotions that you have and going through war and coming back in one piece and doing all that. And then you, you get back and then you kind of feel like, Oh, well, I'm never going to, I'm never going to accomplish that. Get that feeling back again. That's going to be the highlight of my life right there. That's going to be the best it's ever going to get as far as feeling and like purpose in my life. It's going to be that. And mm -hmm. everything else from here on out is going to be, uh, just kind of menial and tedious and secondary to anything else I do for the rest of the rest of my life. Like you can go, I'm not in any danger of winning any Academy Awards, but I can't imagine that if I did, it would feel better than when I walked onto the parade field after stepping foot off the plane, coming back from deployment and everyone's families were there taking pictures. Like just, it felt like I was in the Olympics and we had just won the gold medal or something. It was the coolest feeling walking out in formation and everyone crying and screaming and hooting and hollering. It was like, Nothing will ever come close to that. Nothing. Nothing will. Mm -hmm. That can be depressing because you. it feels like you peaked at 19, 20 years old or whatever. It feels like that's that's the kind of the feeling that you get. And, and that's where a lot of people get lost. But you have to you have to find a way to transition out of that mindset. And it's a hard thing to do. It's a really hard thing to do because it's that's not true. It's just, it just feels that way. But it's just not true because – I can tell you right now, I have four kids and they're all, you know, those, those right there alone are infinitely better than anything I've ever experienced right there. Just on a daily basis, I get, I laugh mm -hmm. off with my kids every single day. And it's just like, you have to find those moments and be, com be, be, you know, comfortable and, uh, and accepting of those being, being what your purpose is, uh, mm -hmm from there on out and you know everyone always looks at you a little differently too because you because you've been to combat because you're mm -hmm. in the military and you went to war and so everyone assumes or just thinks certain things of you or you know yeah it doesn't really matter it, do, it doesn't really matter you know what anyone else thinks you just have to try to get yourself in that place for you because everyone's so different they you have to find that for yourself what you can what you can do to segue out of that that right extreme mindset that you're in right and that and that ties into having like a good support system uh you know ha talking to people you can trust like if you have to think about it you probably shouldn't talk to them at that moment in time not necessarily saying you don't trust them but if if they don't pop up as someone you can trust like immediate like that probably not the best person but then you have to consider your mind you have to consider what state of mind you're in, and also because they very well could be but you're just not thinking clearly so you have to have the, that 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 network and then that and that's important to to get out of that that dark space that veterans are in and yeah i can't even say anything more with what you said because you said all that like spot well, on the money good like I, I lost a couple friends from suicide uh after we came back from iraq and that was a really tough one for me because it's just it's it, it's it's so unnecessary you know it's so it's such a selfish thing to do. First of all, it's an, it's an extremely selfish thing to do. And it's, it's sad that somebody ever, that somebody gets in that. I can see how it can happen a hundred percent because those thoughts cross people's minds, you know, those, they do, but um, there's always people there to help. It doesn't matter. It, it, I'm here to help any, any, but any veteran that's having a hard time, I'm, I'll talk to anytime, any place I'll drop whatever it is I'm doing to help them out if they're good. Cause it's, it's just, it, it's so worth it. It's so, worth that because now I have friends that I don't have here anymore that are that I can't talk to or or I can't help them and they never even they never reached out and that's also the thing that that bums you out is because like dude if you just if you just called me you know if you just called me I would I could have uh I could have talked to you and right and, and then 
being different. on that spectrum, I was I was there. I I almost I almost did it twice. And yeah. from like a perspective for me, like I wasn't even thinking about the phone. Mm-hmm. I all I wanted was the noise to stop. I wanted everything just to be quiet and just turn off because yeah. it was so overwhelming. It was so much, and I was like, well. And I was looking at my best friend's gun, and I was like, "Well, that's one way I can do it, you know." Like, and he wa- he walked in, and like the 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 two opportune times he just happened to walk into his garage, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you know, or like I'm sitting, I know where it's at, and I was like, hmm. And he's like, "No, no, 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 no." And he would he would snap me out of it, but like I can see how, especially doing that, like it's just you you want it to just go away, and you don't realize that 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 time that that's a permanent solution to a temporary problem, Absolutely. because. Like how you said it's selfish. Now you just, yeah, you may have made the noise stop, but now that noise is going to continue to your wife, your husband, your kids, your family, your friends. So now they have all that noise and yet you have no noise. Yeah. It's, it's That's not right. And it's not fair. It's not, it's not. So, and it, and it's, and it's, and it's sad. It's all of those things. It's sad when it happens and it's sad. It's just, it's heartbreaking really, because there's, there's, there's always, a, there's always a way out and that's not a way out. That's, that's just, it's a cop out and it's not, it's not cool. It says you leave, you're hurting a lot of people when you do those things. I don't care who you are. I don't care. Right. I don't, it doesn't matter who you are. It's, it's, it's just a bar. It's just a, bar. it's, there's, you know. Right. And, and like my friend Ed uh, Martin, we deployed together too. Like he says, it's, it, we think it's a burden. And I, I think that too, a lot, even still, sometimes I don't want to be a burden to somebody, you know, because it's like, you know, they have enough problems in their own life. Why do they want to carry on my shit show of problems? You know, no. why do they want to add my mountain of shit to their shit? Because we're the ones that are used to carrying the burdens of ever, of other people. And that's the role that we take pride and comfort and, 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 and doing, we take, we take other, we take problems and we fix them or we, or we help people with their problems and do that. And then when we become that problem, we we're, 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 uh, the machine's broken, you know? that now now we just look at ourselves as a broken unit and uh that can't be fixed and if if I can't be here to help people and ha- help you know have a purpose in that in that regard then there's no point in me being here and that's right and that's that's the whole purpose for why I do this podcast it's just like cuz I know those I know those thoughts they overwhelm in the hardships in the financial and I know I know that it's all there it's just even if they don't, even if they don't even hear any of this of what we're talking or even my past ones, but if they just get one thing, maybe it's a phrase or a sentence or something, it'll yeah. just, it'll jar that thought process and be like, wait a minute, what did he say? You know? And yeah. that, that's, that's, that's my hopes for every time I have someone come on. And, um, that, and this is what I just try to spread, you know? So, and I think, it, I think it's great that, uh, that you come on here and say this stuff, you know, you being in, in the fight as well. And then, uh, putting out these good words and I just try to just spread that. So if anyone's listening, I hope that they hear it too. And just to go now, how did you land the acting gig? Cause we got about, we got a little bit of time left just to kind of touch on that one real quick. How, how'd you get into the whole Hollywood and, and things? So when I'm, when I was a security guy at Universal Studios, I was living in North Hollywood where my aunt and uncle still live now. I was living with my aunt and uncle and, uh, and uh, our neighbor was uh, John is John Wayne's grandson. He was, he moved, he moved down the road, just down the road with his wife, Sarah Arrington. So his, his name is Brendan Wayne and he uh, really good guy, really good friend. He, he, him and his wife and his family are just the nicest people I, you'll ever meet. And they used to send me packages when I was in Iraq. And I came back from Iraq and started doing concrete work. I moved back up to Chico and I was doing concrete work again. And uh, I got a call from his wife, Sarah Arrington, uh, asking if I wanted to audition for a movie. And concrete season was ending. This was October. So concrete was slowing down. I was like, okay, sure. And she goes, it's a Paul Haggis movie, Tommy Lee Jones and Charlize Theron. And I'm like, oh, shit. I thought it was like an extra job on Jack. <laughs> you know? I didn't know what it was. And, uh, and so I started looking through and I got to pick between two characters they wanted me to audition with. And I, I, so I picked one and I was like, yeah, I'll come down. I was flat out broke. I had 200 bucks in my bank account. And I went down and auditioned. And they asked me to come back on, this was on a Friday. They asked me to come back on Monday and audition. So I had to call in work and be like, hey, do you mind if I stay? They want me to come back in and audition for the director and the producers. So like, no, no, I'll stay. And I brought in my photo album from Iraq. I brought in my a medal that I got from Saddam's Palace, the Olympic medal and all that stuff. And and uh, I even have a cigar, a cigar still. I gave it to my uncle from his palace. Uh, but anyway, he uh, so I auditioned for that role. And um, as I'm walking out, I see James Franco walking in and I'm like, 
fuck. There's no way I'm going to get a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And uh, so Sarah Finn, it was Sarah Finn and Randy Hiller uh, casting that did it. Uh, that did it. They do all the Marvel movies. They do all the Star Wars stuff. They're, they're just the, they're the nicest people in there. And I owe them, I really owe them everything because they were the ones that brought me in and gave me a shot. And so Sarah Finn calls me a few days after my audition to tell me, you know, hey, Jake, I just wanted to let you know you did a great job and I really appreciate you coming in. I know you're broke and I know that, you know, you, you know, you don't have a lot going on right now, but I really appreciate you coming in. But the odds of you getting this role were astronomical. You're not, you know, you're not, you, the odds, there was a lot of people, big names that were auditioning for it. So you probably weren't going to get it. And I go, oh, no, no, I, you know, I, that's, I, that, that's okay. I, I really appreciate it. I can tell my grandkids one day, I hear my kids, I, you know, I auditioned for a major Hollywood director, Academy Award winning director and all this, all this stuff. And, and I was just, but I really appreciate it. My heart was sinking into my chest. I was like, damn, I really needed, I really needed this. Cause I was what ifing everything. Like what if I got to be in a movie with Tommy Lee Jones and Charlize Theron? And what if, you know, what if all this stuff, this would be this, like what a dream come true this would be. And I, so my heart was just like down on my stomach and she just said, tell me that, you know, but I would, that the odds of me getting it weren't good. And then I'm, I'm thanking her and she goes, Oh, and by the way, you got the part. <laughs> I go what? And she said, "Congratulations, Jake, you got the part." And I said, "Are you are you serious, Sarah?" And then all of a sudden, I hear these two people laughing, and it's Randy Hiller and my friend Sarah Arrington. <laughs> they're li they're listening on the other line. I go, "Are you you're serious?" She goes, "Yes, Jake, I'm de I'm very serious, and I'm and I'm so happy for you and all this stuff." I go, "I love you. Are you are you I love you all. Are you kidding me? I'm sitting there freaking out, and I." <laughs> room and step my wife's on the phone with her mom and i go stephanie i got i got the part and she drops the phone and starts crying and we're you know and my dad was on his way down to down to burbank to visit my uh my uncle at the time and he's going man i don't know what jake's gonna do he's broke and he has no money and it's like i had to change my flight to come back on to, to for later so it left me with 10 bucks in my bank account and so my dad was freaking out. My uncle, my aunt and uncle knew before I knew that I got the part. So my friends <laughs> around right in the middle of the road, crossing the road right there where all the cars are at Burbank Airport. He goes, oh, by the way, Jackie, uh, Jake got that part. And my dad just drops both of his bags and starts crying in the middle of the road. Right there. Uh, it was a really cool moment. And the cool thing is Brendan Wayne is actually, uh, he's the double for uh, on The Mandalorian. He plays The Mandalorian uh, when, when, for uh, Pedro Pascal. Uh, oh, cool. So he's there all the time on set and doing doing the doing the gig there, which is such a, I mean, talk about a dream job, you know, just work, working on anything. Star Wars is just the coolest yeah. shit you can imagine. I mean, who would want I know, uh, for me, I was an extra on Hawaii Five-0 when I was stationed there. I was one of the bad guys. And that yeah. was fun. I got to wear all black and I got killed and everything because I auditioned for the part of um, uh, McGarrett and I got picked, but because of my tattoos, oh yeah, yeah, they told me no. So I was like, "Son of a bitch!" You I'll know, tell you, I'll tell you right now with tattoos. I don't have a tattoo. I've, there's times I've wanted them back, like wanted tattoos and stuff, but it's just such a pain in the ass when you're acting and they have to cover up your tattoos because you have to show up hours early to to get tattoos. Now I've done roles. The last role I did was this movie called Home, which which was great, but it had a ton of tattoos in it. So I had to show up two hours early before everyone else just to get my tattoos put on. And then any little time I got not, um, not, not actively filming to myself, I couldn't, I didn't have any time myself. I had to go back to the makeup trailer or to get everything touched up or reapplied and do all this stuff every single day. And then another hour and a half to get the, get them all taken off. It can, right. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's one way or the other. It's just like, fuck. Yeah. Like, and I was going to say, and then, and then the even kicker was, it's like, I did the show. It was all cool. Um, then like, Months later, I had just got to Oregon because I got hired at Intel. These fools call me from Hawaii saying they want me to be uh, one of the guest appearances stars for like three episodes. And I'm like, son of a bitch. Like, oh, seriously? Yeah. Like, uh, damn it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's always a thing. There's, there's, there's always stuff. I mean, there's if you're in Washington, I mean, a lot of stuff nowadays uh, is filming up in uh, British Columbia. Up in up up in Canada, so they're not there. Tons of stuff, not almost like not a lot of stuff films in Los Angeles anymore. So, yeah. mo a lot of actors can really live wherever they want, just because most things are done. Auditions now are done mostly through Zoom meetings, which is a whole. That's a whole new. new <laughs> 
I know technology is not your friend either. So <laughs> I was always bad at auditions. I was, I mean, I'd have one every once in a while that I just felt really good about. And like I was in the zone and it felt good, but auditions are a really, I think for all parties involved, not just the actors that are going in for them. Some people are fantastic at auditions. Like I've watched auditions for people do. I'm like, God, that's so good. And I'm like, I wish I could be that good at auditions because I'm just not good at auditions. So I'm lucky to even have ever had any job ever because you're in a blank room with a bunch of people you most of the time never met before and they're all evaluating you. It's pretty nerve wracking uh, at times. And it's, and even still after having gone on thousands of auditions in my career, I mean, just insane amounts of auditions. Seven, I did seven in one day, you know, auditions. I won't do that again. Cause that's just spreading yourself too thin. But now we're having this to do um, either put yourself on tape, which is, which is better just because it gives you time to kind of get a little bit more of how you want it. Um, but now a lot of times you're doing Zoom auditions. So it'd be me with you and maybe six other people here, but maybe I'm just looking at you on the screen like I'm doing it and auditioning a scene. And you're kind of like, you know, do I stand up? Do I, do I <laughs> damn if you do, damn if you don't thing, you second guess yourself. But that's why I always do better on set because I actually have the things there. Uh, green screen's fun to do. I like doing the green screen stuff just because like you can, you can imagine whatever is, whatever is there. Yeah. In a room, and you're having to look at a computer. It's a little, a little odd, a little odd. But yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming around, I guess. But yeah, no, that's all good. So yeah. we'll we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this up. But I know, when I know we had spoke before. I know there was a special shout out you wanted to give to someone who helped orchestrate this whole thing. So, so go ahead. what's your mama's name again? Uh, is Isabel. Is Isabel. Isabel. Thank you so much for. Uh, nudging your son to get a hold of me. I'm really happy that he did. And uh, and thanks for watching the show and being a fan. I really appreciate it. Big time. Thank you, everybody. Big time. Yeah, I appreciate it. And that's like, like I said, this happened because of her. She's like, you should just message him. And I was like, well, all right. I mean, I don't know how. We'll see what happens. And then here we are, you know, no. made a new friend, you know, our veteran buddy. So my pleasure. And anytime, you know, veterans get a hold of me, I, 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 I'm like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. You know, it's my, it's, it's more me than anything else. So it's just, it's just the, uh, you know, military stuff was just what I like, you know, it's just, it's good. Yeah. And, totally. and you said, as far as like a piece of advice that I, yep. for people that, um, I told this story before, but there, when I got out, uh, my, my best friend is his sister and his dad passed away in a plane crash. And I was working at a lumber yard in Savannah. And it was before I had a cell phone and anyone had cell phones. It was a 2000. Oh, I didn't have one. It was 2006. So I, I didn't have one yet. But um, I couldn't get a hold of my boss. So I know I needed to go leave to go back to California to help them or Nevada to go help them look for my buddy's dad. Because I had been talking to him, you know, right the day before he passed away. He was, you know, he practically raised me. And uh, so I got fired. It was the only job I've ever been fired from was because I left for a week to go help my buddy search for his, his dad and his sister. Um, and they, they let me go. Uh, they didn't want to, but I, but I left without letting them know. So they were kind of without, and I told them, I said, I understand, but I'm wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. Right. So I didn't have a job and I was, all I wanted to do was get out of Georgia and move back to California. That was the one thing I let my wife know, like, I'm not staying here or leaving. And, uh, and so I didn't have a job and I moved in with my in-laws to save money so that I could move back to California and take my wife with me and, and the kids. And, um, Actually, she was pregnant with my son at the time. And so this Kirby vacuum salesman came to the door and starts giving us the whole Kirby spiel and taking it in. I'm like, oh, this thing's cool. You know, I'm buying into the whole thing. Like, this thing's rad. Oh, wow, there's that many dust mites everywhere I step. Like, uh, you know, the whole deal. <laughs> like, hey, are you guys hiring? Because I didn't care. I just needed a job. I wanted a job to get money to go. And so I started doing that. I started selling Kirby vacuums door to door because you got to do what you got to do. And um, and I was training. And I'm in Richmond Hill, Georgia, knocking on doors, doing my training a couple weeks later and I knock on a door and it ends up being my Sergeant Major's door. Sergeant Major Bob, Bob Gallagher. And he, uh, he was in Mogadishu. He was a really actually a famous Sergeant Major in the, in the, in the army. Uh, he was in Black Hawk down in Ranger battalion. He was, you know, he did all sorts of crazy shit. He was cool. And uh kind of guy that when you ask him for a cigarette in Iraq, he'd take out three out of the pack and give you the rest of the pack and keep three for himself. That's what he, you know, that's, that's the kind of guy he was. Sergeant Major Bob. Uh, he passed away right after he retired a few years ago. Um, we went to his memorial service in uh, D.C., which is a really – I think everybody, if you have a chance, should go to Arlington Cemetery and, and check it out, by the way. But he pulled me – anyway, long story short, I'm long story long, I guess. He pulled me 
told my boss, the guy that was training me, to wait outside, and he pulls me into his house. He goes, Mac Nuts, what are you, what are you doing? And I, and I go, well, I'm selling Kirby vacuum, Star Major, because you don't call him by his yeah. – you know, still, he's still Star Major. And he goes, he goes Get, come inside. You wait out here. And he, for about four minutes, he sat, he sat me inside and gave me this big talk, like, what are, you, what are you doing? You're selling vacuums after everything that you just did? After going to, going on deployment, doing all this stuff, doing all the training, all the all the things that you accomplished, and you're selling vacuums. Look, I'm not getting on you about about you know working and stuff because if you need a job, you have to work and stuff. But don't let this be be your end game. You you you're way better than this. You're com- you're capable of so much more than than this. And it was just kind of like I felt a little shamed, you know, like I was I felt a little bit like shame of, of, of doing it, but I was also like oh, I was still a job. But I ended up quitting the job the next day and and applying at a, at a different place, but. It was just this big long talk that he gave me about how I'm I'm worth more than this after what I've accomplished and I, and, and the advice that I give to people is what I took away from that is that if you're ever doubting yourself or having those moments where you're down and out or you're or you're having panic attacks or you're doing anything else just remember that what of what you've accomplished already you've already done it there's nothing that this this civilian world can throw at you that you can't handle now you've already done so much more than what 99% of the population has done and they will never know or experience and they won't get it. But you have a support group out there of, of brothers that have done the same thing. So reach out to them, but just know that you've already done what you, you've already done great things and that you're capable of maintaining doing those great things. So to have that confidence in yourself and, uh, and to hold your head high, because there's no reason to, to, to be down and out. You, you're the one that stepped up and answered the call. You're the one that did that. Nobody else did it for you. Nobody talked you into doing it. Nobody made you do it. No one had a gun to your head to do it. You did it. You made that decision and you did it and you followed it through and you, and you, and if you just keep that, that mentality and, and you're going to be, you, you can do anything you want, anything you want at all. That's, you know? that's, you know, I, that, that, that's perfectly put. I got nothing else to add to that. That is like spot on perfect. Like, so I appreciate you for coming on. Uh, for anyone listening, take listen to his words. You know, yeah. it's there is they're good. Um, they hit home. They pull on the they pull on the heartstrings and everything. And it's just listen to what he's saying and listen to the other podcasts on what they say at the end too. It's just you're not alone. You're you have help. I mean, you can get in contact with me, and if you need help, I can put you in contact with Jake. And then if you really need help to talk to someone, we can do that. We'll work it out. We'll figure it out together as a veteran community. You're not by yourself. I've been by myself, and it sucks ass. I know there's moments Jake's been by himself and it sucks ass and it's just no more. Now it's time to just build each other up and just help each other out. And just to show you that you are worth it and you matter. That's that's the the bottom line of this. I know Um, think less of you for, for needing help. Everyone needs help at some point or another. Everybody. I don't care who you are. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Every single person at some point or another needs help. And we're more than happy to help. Any helping is what we do. So we, and then um, just want to say thank you for coming on. My mom says thanks for acknowledging her. She's just right there. So <laughs> <laughs> you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for getting me in touch with your son and uh and, and for everything. I, I appreciate all the support. Really do. awesome. Then um, everyone have a happy new year. Be safe. Don't drink. If you're gonna drink, don't drive. If you're gonna drive, don't drink. Be smart. Have a plan. Um, there's Ubers. There's Lyfts. There's ride shares. There's all the stuff out there. Just be smart and be safe. And uh, because if you do that, you're endangering yourself and other people. So just make smart decisions for this New Year's Eve, please. Nope. With all this stuff that's available nowadays, with all those Ubers and Lyfts, there's no excuse for a DUI. And trust me, you don't want one of those. Yeah. So one. Had one, but you don't want one. <laughs> uh, so again, Jake, thanks for coming on, dude. I appreciate it. And then. Um, Everyone, stay tuned next week because I'll have someone else special up on here. So just stay tuned next week. See you guys later. Have a happy new year. Thanks, everybody.